Welcome to Conversations with Klarna, made for the modern woman who wants to raise her self-esteem, increase her satisfaction, and build happy and loving relationships with herself and others. More and more, women feel they have lost their spark and the connection to themselves and miss deep intimacy in their lives. Rather than accept a life that doesn't shine, they want to change to one that does. Join the conversation each week when Klarna and her guests explore practical ways and positive solutions to living a new, authentic life based on self-love, connection, harmony, and joy. Now, here is your host, Transformation Catalyst, author and speaker, Klarna. Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Klarna. Today I have a very special guest from far, far away from Australia. <laughs> Hello, Mayola. Hello, Clara. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And I, I will just introduce you a little bit so that people know who you are and then they get even more from you, of you, when we are talking. <laughs> so, Mayola Woods is an award winner and I will ask her what kind of award it, it is that she won. <laughs> she is an author, a certified sexological body worker, a somatic sex educator and an international intimacy and sex coach. Mayola is a pioneer with courage who bravely speaks about the things that make most of us uncomfortable. Mayola will gently lead you out of your comfort zone and into the zone of personal growth and higher self-awareness. She specializes in teaching individuals and couples the art of connection, creating and cultivating the choice of arousal to deepen intimacy, sensation and pleasure, even if it has been a very long time. As a sexual being, mother of four teenagers and pleasure enthusiast, Mayola appreciates the time constraints, daily and social pressures that can play havoc on our erotic lives. Mayola teaches ways to explore and enhance your lovemaking in everyday life. So welcome again, Mayola. I am so well, happy to have you here. And we have some things in common. And I wanted to have you on my podcast for a long time. And now I took action and asked you if you want to be here. <laughs> I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled. I've been watching and watching and watching. And, and now I got an invite. It's great. Yay. Yeah. So we, don't, we didn't know each other in person. We never talked before. So this is the very first time. First time. And we, we jump right in and I love these situations because then everything can, can unfold. Yeah. We can so, see, just see where the, where the conversation goes and what, what is alive in this moment. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you, you, you mentioned the award and you said you were going to ask. So it was, it was, a, it was it's actually a mainstream business award. And for me, as a sex educator and someone who is not always, I'm not always welcomed, I think, in the business world and I'm not always welcomed in, in lots of worlds. So to be recognised as a business that is thriving in mainstream and to have that uh, I suppose that exposure and that bring to light to people that sex educators and we can get sex education was quite, I think it's, it's quite the feat for me. It, it's more, I think that, that it's in the mainstream world is kind of more alive for me than if it were, I don't, I'm not sure what other words there are, but because I'm in there, I think that's, that says something about the work that I'm doing. Yeah, congratulations. And it's so important that we come out of the closet with, a, with this topic, sexuality. There's so much taboo and I have no idea how it is in Australia, to be honest. So are people very prudish, very holding back or are they more open on that topic? I think we, would, we could go with the more prudish would be, we, we, could, we could go there. Um, you know, nudity is quite, mm, you know, not for, it's frowned upon and so, People don't talk about their sexuality. People, you know, talk about, they use words like we went to the bedroom and, you know, um, down there and um, 
So there's, there's quite a bit of education to do. And, and lots, I think, of people who, even though, you know, I suppose Australians would be seen as people who are open, I think we have moved into a place, even before COVID, where we decided that touch was something we could do without. And like, I'm not just talking about sexual touch, but, you know, touch in general. And I meet lots of people who say, you know, it's not really worth it. I don't really, I don't really feel like I want a partner. I don't feel like I want to go through that anymore. And I think that makes me sad that when we yeah. get to a point where, because as mammals, we love touch and we love connecting with people. So and where it's so does important. that important? It's even yeah, where does that important fit? for our yeah, surviving, so. huh? isn't it? So like, like little babies, they can die if they don't get touched. Yes, 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 yes. Well, they don't thrive, do they? Babies yeah. don't thrive if they don't have touch. Yeah. But somewhere we lose that, Hana, I think. Uh, we lose a, that. It's a pity. Mm. So let us, may I ask you a few personal questions? <laughs> so sure. how, did, how did you discover that you wanted to work in that field? I didn't, I didn't probably know I wanted to work in sexuality. I've always had two folds with either education and body work and I started sort of in the energetic realms in the metaphysical realms and moved into more of massage and then more into working with women and pregnancy and then I had my own children and I struggled to orgasm so I and I've got trauma so I wanted to know how that how that affected the body how that affected pleasure how that affected orgasm so really, Kana, I think I've been my own, um, my own guinea pig for lots of things. Mm -hmm. So, and then you, you found out about the training? So and I went along as I was moving through and I'm just having my own journey with sexuality and my own pleasure and my own orgasms. I then discovered that people came and saw me and no matter kind of what it was, it was a pain in their shoulder or a pain in their toe often there was some intimacy or some communication or something that was missing. And so I went on it. Yeah. So then I went and got some qualifications and I just discovered there wasn't anyone talking about it. There wasn't anyone discussing how the energetics of sexuality went together, how, um, how things get stored in our body. I mean, now I think that's much, much more open than it was a number of years ago. And I've just developed into sexuality and relationships and intimacy over the over my time and i just i suppose i love it which is what mm -hmm. and it brings for me it brings all of the parts of my work together so it brings my intuition together it brings my qualifications together it brings my education together it brings my love of bodies and you know working and so how does that how does that get together and i get to work with people on a really intimate i get to hear you know stories that have never been told before mm -hmm. it's the same here with me and and this is this is great when we can offer people a room where they can open up and and talk because sometimes it's often already a big big step if they can talk about things that they can not talk with anybody else and then the next step is becoming um more open to also do the body work yes But, yeah Yes, yes. So and there's a place where we've, you know, when we've kept something secret for so long, I find, as, as I'm sure you find, when people start to, even, to share that, everything changes about them. Yeah. They're, the way they hold their body, the way that they think, the way they interact, the way they connect, because this space is not <coughs> contracted in here. Exactly. And when you are talking about this, I'm getting goosebumps and I, I see your face smiling. That's exactly why we are doing that job, isn't it? <laughs> that, that's so, so great. I, I love that too. Um, you wrote a book. I did. Let us know a little bit about that. I did write a book. Um, I have written, um, I have a published, you know, hard copy book. And so it's called, It's an Inside Job. 12 seductive secrets to your arousal and how how i came about it was people what kept asking me well how do i do that 
Like, how do I, you know, what do I do with my partner to create that intimacy, that connection? What do I do with myself? And, and so I think often we think that our eroticism or our sexuality or our sensuality, whatever word you want to call it, depends on a partner. Is that, is that how you have found it? Exactly, but it isn't. I always tell people it starts with yourself and it has nothing to do with the partner because if you don't love yourself, no matter in which way, bodily or in general, you cannot, ex um, you cannot really love a, a partner. Partners are not there to fill up your empty space. You need to be full and then share the fullness of another person. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. So that's it, you know, so I, so I created the book around having exercises for individuals so that we can do exactly that, is love ourselves, fill our own cup, find, and find out about ourselves. Because I find that lots of times we don't know, and not necessarily just what we like and what we don't like. Sometimes that's an easy, sometimes it's not. But what, what are the curious parts? What are the subtle parts? What are the, what are the nuances that happen in touch and feelings and creating within myself because if I can create that here then I can create that with someone else if I'm yeah. waiting for someone to bring that to me I may never get it yes that's exactly true and it's still in a lot of people they think that other person needs to fill the the, the empty spaces yeah. and that it's a good learning for them <laughs> a good first step to see, uh-uh, that's not the case. I need to start with myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I yeah. was so I was the same before I started that route, that path. Yeah. So I had a bad body image. I was inhibited um, up to here. And now I'm like you. We are talking about those un uncomfortable topics without hesitating. So it's so it's what really what changed for you? For you, Kana? Uh, the shame, I lost a lot of shame. The most thing was around shame, located about shame, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that helped totally <laughs> to, do, to do the training to become a sexological body worker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that the went shame. fast. That went fast? The, yeah. the training went fast or you shifted the shame fast? No, I, I shifted it fast through the training. Yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. during the training, I bumped against some resistances still. And it's not that I'm completely shameless. No, not at all. I know where, where my boundaries are now, but they, I, can, I can stretch them. I, I could stretch them and it gave me the possibility to experience more things that I wouldn't have taken into consideration before. Yes, yes, it's discovering those new parts, I find. And, and then, yeah, so in my, in my book, the other section is the couples. And so what I think is what I say to people, when you're reading the book together, you can say, the woman says, she says it, she says we should do this, and she says, that we could ask this question and she says we could sit like this and she says this. And I think some of that, I'm happy to be the, the kind of um, accountable one, that they're accountable to me or that uh, it's not them suggesting it, it's kind of taking that, that pressure off, that it's me suggesting it. So I think there's a little bit of freedom in there that they can then be, because I think we have so much pressure about having to get it right. And I just, that if we can take that off and if we can get rid of that, then we can have fun. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm totally with you. The pressure is not necessary. Yeah. And I think you can, you can let go of pressure big time when you start communicating. Yes. And when we, and when we can share from a place of this might be clunky, I don't, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I think I might like to try it. And if it's not, if it doesn't go well, we'll try something else. Exactly. But I think when we have the pressure, and I think the pressure then makes it that it's not curious and it's not fun and it's not 
let's try something. It's more, well, geez, I may only have one chance. So if I don't get it right now, then what will happen? I don't get to have my, I don't get to have my orgasm for the week or I don't get to have something. Yeah. And do you think it's always about the orgasm? I think that for lots of people, it's a, well, I think it's always about orgasm and whether you're having them or you're not having them. <laughs> yeah, but I think sometimes it's also great not to take the orgasm as the goal, but just explore more. And if you have it, it's fantastic, but it's not a drama if it doesn't happen. <laughs> and I think that creates pressure as well. So I think for lots of people, there is a lot of pressure around sex. Yes. And I think that also we have a very, we tend to have a very narrow view of what sex is. So we kind of just have this idea, it's kind of just penetration and that's, that's it. That's, well, that's a very narrow view. And again, you know, if you're looking at curiosity, then you can, you can expand that and you can have, like I often ask people, when does sex begin and when does it end? Do you have an answer for that question? <laughs> well, usually they tell me the answer. When does it, where does it start and where does it finish for them? Usually they answer me. And usually usually the, the light bulb goes off of, well, why do I finish then? Why do I do that? And why do I think that that's the starting point? What if I, and so usually the question, that usually there's a little bit of pondering of, you know, a few seconds of, well, what did she ask me? What? <laughs> I thought it started here and I thought it finished here. So usually my, my answer is, it, does it have to start and finish? And what would happen if it didn't? What if you just continued? And if you expanded what sex looked like, you could be flirting or you could, be, you could touch somebody's leg and keep it going and you could, you know, keep the, keep the flame going, keep those embers burning rather than having to start from scratch all the time and just, you know, kind of keep it weaving. And I mean, and it could be intense moments and then it could be really subtle moments. It could be connected moments. It could be, you know, parts where you're separate. But I think it's our minds that say sex looks like this, and only this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have that experience too mm. with my clients and, also with myself so i i will not exclude me from anything <laughs> you're in berlin klana and i would have a picture so i would have a picture a stereotype that um berlin is very open mm -hmm. is, am i am i right and is that how most people are or is that not to be honest i'm living like a hermit so i cannot really tell <laughs> but I am living in Berlin for a little bit over a year now. And before okay. I used to live in Ibiza for nine years. And it was a, a place where it was quite free. Yes. And this is why I think Berlin is some a little bit like that too. Because yes. if not, I couldn't be living there at all. I need the, the atmosphere of, a, of freedom and openness and not too close this is in a little village or so where people are very closed up that's nothing for me anymore so i would say yes but i i don't actually know <laughs> okay okay but if it feels that way then yeah. it might be yeah mm -hmm. is sydney different to other spaces or do you experience that as well that the different locations in australia have different openness i think it's one of those things that when you find an open group they've kind of always been there and all of a sudden you find more open groups and you wonder well where was i must have been living um somewhere else i think melbourne is probably a little bit more open than sydney is my experience and my experience from teaching down there is that they're a little bit more open and a bit more and interested i suppose mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a cultural thing or maybe they're just more interested. Maybe they're just looking for more, more adventurous. 
when when you're teaching you just said you're teaching here and there so you you are changing locations and uh, what what are you doing at the moment during covid okay are you allowed to work with people in person or what are you doing now <laughs> Uh, I'm not working in person with people currently. Um, so my, all of my work has gone online. Mm -hmm. um, so that's... I, I was working online before, so it wasn't a big shift for me, but it hasn't changed really the way I work. I'm so thankful for the internet because I yeah. love the, the internationality of, of all of that. This is also a reason why I love to have you here from Australia. So it, it gives us totally different and more opportunities to spread our words. Mm -hmm. And what I realized during COVID before, I didn't know that so much that, it, that it's possible to teach body work online, but it is. It really works fantastically, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think that it's, if we approach it the same sort of way and And I think that for me and the colleagues I've spoken to, it's made us realize how much our body talks to us that sometimes we don't pick up in a face-to-face -face session. Mm -hmm. Whereas in, in something like this, when we're on Zoom, we really, we really tuned in and we're really sort of capturing well, what's my body and what's their body and what can I... We've, I think it's enhanced that ability. That's, that's intuitive somatic ability. Yeah. And I... I think it's good that people can hear that because some, some people think you, they need to be in person with you. And it, this is actually not the case. And some, sometimes I even prefer to talk to clients on the phone or without picture because then I'm not distracted by what I see. I can totally feel in. And this is, of course, different from person to person, how they perceive other energies. Yeah. Yeah, and it also depends on what they're working on as well. You know, I think we've done, you know, so we've taken meditation and I've been, you know, a meditator for a long time. <clears throat> I must have been hard to get to sleep. And so my mum, you know, it's a long time ago now. My mum, when I was about eight, must have done this stress management course. I was an only child. I'm sure I wasn't that bad, but, you know, she was off doing a stress management course and she learned how what I would now call probably a yoga nidra, so a full body relaxation and breathing. And she used to do that with me every day. So, you know, I think we've been, or, or people would still be on the meditation path, but, you know, that meditation and the yoga, so that the physical practice and bringing that spirituality in. And for me, you know, I suppose what the sexological body work did and bringing that orgasmic yoga for me brought that, those together, or the, like the three parts together. And so what I find is that is the orgasmic yoga is my erotic practice. So it's my meditation. It's my communion with God. It's my physicalness and getting in my body and being in my body and enjoying my body and in finding out what is sensual, what is erotic, what is up for me today? What is, what is it? And because sometimes it's as simple as, you know, rubbing a leaf on my, on my cheek. Sometimes it's much more elaborate and, you know, there's music and candles and lights and toys and, blah 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 um, but sometimes you know we can just enjoy the simple things and so I think the next stage of our evolution and you know what I'd like to see on every corner I suppose because yoga studios are on every corner now is that you know orgasmic yoga and that erotic practice bringing to to everyone would you please explain to people what or, uh, um, orgasmic yoga is because I think a lot of them don't know it <laughs> Okay, so orgasmic yoga, I'm going to explain my version of orgasmic yoga. Joseph Kramer has, um, is the founder, the pioneer of orgasmic yoga. So go check him out. He's amazing. Um, but for me, orgasmic yoga involves the principles of breath. And for me, it's learning how to breathe so that we can get our nervous system to do what we want to do. So learning how to hack our nervous system. So if we want to be more aroused, if we want to be more relaxed, and then we can use them in every day. We don't only have to use them in our sexuality. We can use them if we want to do a big project. So incorporating our breath, incorporating movement, moving our body, sound. And, you know, sometimes I think sound is very inhibiting for people and we get very 
So even just starting to hum, even starting gets the nervous system, gets the nervous system moving. You know, so we've got breath, sound, movement, touch. So learning how to touch, being curious with touch. So bringing them all together. And if you've listened to anything Joseph Kramer, he talks about often what happens is we use one of them and then we forget about the others. So when, and if we don't practice outside of sex, then when we get aroused, we forget. And so we might be touching someone or touching ourselves and we get very aroused and get very excited and then we forget to breathe. Does anyone else forget to breathe? Does anyone else, you know, as they're getting close to orgasm, <laughs> they, they short their breath? They, so um, I'm sure I'm not alone. So if we can use our breath to then relax, and I think there's even, like I, for myself, there's a, there's a few different ways to get into orgasm, but I think the one we kind of use is tensing. Mm. And I think the another way is to go in relaxing and to go in. And to kind of, you know, let the breath and let the movement and let everything have us. But often, you know, when we, when we do one thing and then we forget about the rest. So the idea of the practice is that we can then put the four together. And if you've ever danced with someone and you're treading on each other's toes, it's because you can't move and kind of move around together. So if you practice, then you can you know, learn how to dance without stepping on each other's toes. Thank you. That was a wonderful explanation. <laughs> I love orgasmic going. I love it. I, just, yeah. I, can, I can see it. <laughs> it's cool. So, Mayola, is there anything that you really want to get off your chest before we close okay. here? I, I suppose I do, just when we talked a little bit about what society does and what shame does, sometimes I think having a look at where things come from. So where does our belief around sex and orgasms and shame, where does it come from? Where does it come from growing? And Hollywood, like I think that sometimes we underestimate how much we see in a Hollywood about sex and romance and love and how much we expect that to play out and we expect how much we expect it to look like that. And we can blame porn as well. We can blame that. But I think Hollywood has you know a lot to do with it as well where they you know kind of get you know there's this one crescendo moment and you know they don't tell you it's taken them five days to you know edit and cut that to get that one moment they don't mention that bit you're just supposed to get there i've just um and you know they talk you know and the aesthetics of things you know the women particularly you know they arch their back and they put their head back you know in from, from a breath point of view and a sexuality point of view, that that's not always the best way to kind of let things flow. But aesthetically, for a camera, it's beautiful. Exactly. So I think, you know, questioning where, does, where do my thoughts come from and where do my behaviour come from and how much of that has gone in without even unconsciously. Yeah. Thank you for adding that to the conversation. That's important too. And thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was very interesting. And I hope as well teaching for the listener and the viewers. <laughs> thank you so much for thank being you. here, Mayola. And I will put in the show notes all the details how people can find you. for listening to conversations with Klarna remember to follow us on social media and get connected visit our website conversationswithklarna.com for show notes and additional episodes and if you like this broadcast please share it with your friends to help us empower more women to live an authentic and happy life and make this world a better place for everyone